Okay, just uh, to tell you right away, because even he asked me how to pronounce my name, nobody really can. It's Milos, and last name is Sharchev. But that is fun to anything that starts with M or S. So, uh, just like uh, he said, I'm one of the busiest uh, IBB professionals. I competed over 100 times in my life, uh, 38 times as an amateur, and 70 times as a professional. And uh, I believe that uh, having uh, over 100 shows under my belt, I had quite a uh, experience about pre-contest training and uh, dieting. Also, if uh, you're familiar with some of the top professionals, I've been uh, lately in the last five years preparing many of the top IBB pros for the competitions. Uh, so I would be uh, absolutely at your disposal for any kind of questions as far as training and nutrition. I actually asked Ken if I would have a, maybe 15, 20 minutes at the end that I can talk about pre-contest nutritional strategies. Uh, of course, coming back here after Lee Haney, it's a uh, hard act to follow. You, you guys have seen Lee, and I'm going to say right away that, of course, he probably can't hear me. I agree with him in some points and disagree in many other points. And uh, from the very beginning, I want to say that um, one of my idols, childhood, childhood heroes, was uh, Bruce Lee. And one thing that I learned from him is uh, to accept everything that is useful from anybody and uh, uh, take in consideration something that makes sense, apply to my techniques, and something that is useless I would just throw away and, and uh, uh, disregard, and then I would make my own experience. So, who was here last year? You guys saw uh, Dorian Yates, also uh, several times Mr. Olympia, just like uh, Mr. Lee Haney. And uh, I know personally that they have a different views on many training techniques and, and so on. So. Uh, I'm also very much open-minded. I would listen to what everybody had to say from back Serge uh, Nubre, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then uh, Lee Haney, Rich Gaspari, and so on. Uh, as a pre-contest training uh, techniques is a subject of this seminar, I want to say that the first <coughs> and the biggest misconception that most of the guys had throughout the years is that uh, off-season we would train a certain way and then pre-contest we would train that. We would change into a different kind of training techniques. So off-season we would supposed to train heavy, and pre-contest we supposed to train light. I don't know if you guys heard that, but when I was back in Yugoslavia, that's the first thing that I learned. Off-season train heavy, pre-contest you, you know, drop the weight, use high repetitions, and that's how you get in shape. Well, as you know by now that uh, this uh, would never work because training that made you big would keep you big. And if you try to change that principle and close to the contest, switch from very heavy training and maybe exclusively fast twitch muscle fiber stimulating exercises, going into the light training and more slow twitch muscle fiber uh, uh, stimulating exercises, more than likely you would lose uh, muscle mass. Because if you don't stimulate those specific fibers in that 6, 10, 16, or 20 week period of time that you're training for a contest, you would lose the size. So uh, I would make a first point that uh, uh, pre-contest and uh, off-season training should be identical, really. The, uh, actually, uh, pre-contest, I would insist of uh, maintaining as heavy weight as possible for everyone. The only thing that I would add to it is uh, maybe extra you know, workouts and, and uh, uh, a little bit more extra activities. So instead of maybe training just once a day, I would go into two, day, two times a day training, but uh, still maintaining fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fiber uh, training for each muscle group at every workout. So my principles there would be that um, for each muscle group I would do four different exercises. Uh, first two, I would uh, focus on the fast twitch muscle fiber simulation, so I would pick some, uh, pick some uh, compound move, uh, bench presses, um, barbell curls, uh, bend over rows, and so on, and use uh, very heavy weight that I can hardly do between, uh, let's say, five and eight repetitions. That what science told us stimulates uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. Dorian Yates was here last year, and I did train with Dorian many times, and I know that his uh, uh, idea of training heavy-duty system is uh, 
in a very a few sets, as a matter of fact, one or two, uh, and that would be enough. Then we had, uh, of course, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, other guys that before were using uh, five different exercises for each muscle group, five sets each, and so on. So I always had that debate, what is really enough, what is not enough, and what is too much as far as uh, how many heavy sets we should do. Uh, Mike Manzer and Dorian believe that one set all out is all we need. And then, uh, of course, uh, Arnold and other guys would do multiple sets. I had uh, also many times opportunity to be interviewed for Muscle Fitness Magazine, and uh, there is debate still going on. We can't really say, you know, how can you argue with Dorian's results? He, you know, made tremendous improvements in the years and, of course, uh, worked for him. But like I said, you know, for me, I tried that uh, uh, technique and I just couldn't do it. From simple reason that, let's say, if I would do four different exercises for each muscle group, and I would go with his one set all out, you know, from the very beginning, I would probably uh, injure myself if I would jump on right away and do my all out set on bench press or, uh, let's say, squats. Uh, if I could do squats, at the time when I, when I was training intensely, I would do six sets, uh, I mean, sorry, six repetitions with uh, my final weight, and I was usually uh, 600 pounds. I cannot understand who can uh, suggest to me or anybody else to maybe come to the gym to do the quadriceps, warm up one or two sets, and then go straight into the 600 pounds. For me, that was just uh, injury waiting to happen. And uh, uh, maybe it did work for Dorian, but uh, uh, I don't know many other guys to this day at the professional level that train that way. So what I would actually suggest and my um, training philosophy on that is uh, uh, after, you know, stretch and in a proper warm-up, I would uh, slowly increase my weight if it's, let's say, bench press, for example. I would do maybe three or four warm-up sets. Uh, and uh, then I would hit my target weight that I can hardly do, you know, six repetitions. Those warm-up sets also, uh, I would like to emphasize this, I would not exhaust myself because usually uh, guys would do 135 pounds for 20 repetitions, then add weight, do 15, and then add, do 10 repetitions and so on. I uh, don't believe in that. I think that uh, this is basically just exhausting yourself for no reason. I would still maintain maybe just five or six slow performing uh, uh, sets, uh, repetitions on each set, warm-up set, just preparing myself for that first set of uh, six with my target weight. And that first set of six, uh, I would actually like to perform in a slower manner. You know, tempo would be slower. And also for the uh, reasons of avoiding injuries. You know, so if, uh, I'm sure that you guys try that uh, if you try to attempt your maximum weight that you can maybe do six repetitions and you try to do it much slower, you would have a very hard time, you know, reaching uh, six repetitions. It's much harder because uh, time that the muscle is under the tension is much longer and therefore more than likely you're going to fail much sooner, maybe on a third or fourth repetition. But I found this very safe way to actually, you know, go with a very heavy weight stimulating fast switch muscle fibers, you know, you know, failing on that five or six or seven repetitions, they stimulate, uh, you know, the white muscle fiber that gives us the most bulk and, and, and uh, size. So, <clears throat> again, uh, after proper warm-up, like I said, I would choose a way that I can hardly do between five and eight repetitions because I find that rep range best for uh, uh, fast switch muscle fiber stimulation. I would use on the first set way that I can possibly do eight repetitions at my max, but I would do it slower, slower eccentrically, so slower concentrically. And uh, I would, you know, more than likely fail on the fifth or sixth repetition, which right away is good fast switch muscle fiber stimulating set. I didn't exhaust myself to the, uh, you know, to the end, but I would prepare myself for my second set, which would usually be that all out set. This is that one set that Dorian always claims this is the only thing you need. So my second set is really my all-out set that I would uh, attempt. But then I would leave third set where I would actually use uh, my partner and do four reps. And uh, you know, whatever I didn't accomplish in that second set, I would definitely do it on, on my third. Because uh, 
if you guys try to really go all out sets, you would see that it's impossible to really do three sets in a row with the same amount of repetitions. You would, uh, if you fail on that second set, you would not be 100% able to perform the same amount of repetitions on the third. So my third set would actually be uh, assisted with a partner, you know, four reps. And as you guys know, using a partner, you would actually, of course, include all these muscle fibers that probably you didn't reach in that uh, all-out set. So in my opinion, to clarify this, multiple sets or one all-out, I don't believe in one all-out, and I don't believe in too many sets, but I believe that three sets is really optimal for uh, uh, fast-stitch muscle fiber stimulation that uh, uh, we can assume that we have accomplished our goal, really stimulating that fiber to the max. A second exercise for the uh, same muscle group, I would choose different movement, of course, uh, going from different angle, reaching di different uh, fibers of the same muscle. There is no reason to warm up this time because we have already sufficiently warmed up on the first uh, exercise. And I would do just straight two or maybe three working sets, again, trying to fail anywhere between uh, five and 10 repetitions. So still very heavy. And uh, uh, somebody brought the uh, question uh, to Lee, like how much is the uh, time between uh, you know, two sets, how much is that uh, uh, recuperation time in between sets, and he mentioned 25 or 30 seconds. You know, for me, I, I would probably need more than 30 seconds just to get up from the bench. I don't think that this is really feasible, you know, and uh, uh, if you really try to attempt those heavy, heavy weights, you'll see that uh, you're gonna need you know, much more than even a minute. And uh, Ben is uh, also here, one of the trainers, that uh, uh, Charles Polikin is somebody that, uh, that I respect very much and I train with him uh, on several occasions. Nervous system needs much more time for recovery than a uh, you know, muscular system. And if you really push to the limit, if you really go to the failure, you would you know, need considerable more time. And nervous system takes much longer than, uh, than a muscular system to recover. So I would say, uh, realistically, for those uh, working sets for fast switch muscle fiber simulation, I would probably go between two and three minutes. And uh, for, uh, let's say, legs, you know, more than likely up to five minutes. Because if anybody is going to tell me that it's possible to go, you know, faster than that, uh, I would really like to uh, challenge them and, and let them do it in front of me. So uh, two or three minutes would be a recuperation time in between those working sets. But you have to consider again, if it's only three working sets in two different exercises, it's not like much time that you're spending. So second two exercises for a same muscle group would be now uh, slow twitch muscle fiber stimulated uh, exercises that I would do more of those advanced technique, peak contraction, continuous tension, drop sets, anything that comes in your mind. And on those particular ones, I would go really for mind-muscle connection, you know, for that extra squeeze, you know, on those, you know, you really have to focus on that. When you're going all out, if I'm doing a squat with 600 pounds, I can't really be thinking so much on contraction and squeezing, because you're just trying to, you know, get that weight off your back, of course. So, <clears throat> uh, to generalize again, each muscle group, peak contest, I would uh, highly suggest to still go as heavy as you can because, again, the training that made you big would keep you big. Fast stitch muscle fibers that are stimulated during off-season with that heavy weight would uh, disappear in uh, two or three months of training light pre-contest if you don't, you know, again, stimulate those muscles. Uh, I'm victim of that kind of training back in Yugoslavia when I was doing this. I didn't know better. So I actually always lost the size pre-contest doing my lightweights. Uh, I do train uh, with several top pros, and I can tell you right now that most of the pros are following the same uh, principle. Uh, Dennis James is one of the guys that uh, <coughs> I prepare for the show. Uh, uh, he always trains extremely heavy. Um, Ronnie Coleman, Mr. Olympia, uh, he's uh, still the same in training multiple sets two times a day and again have a phenomenal results. On the other hand, Dorian, presenter last year, as you guys know, did 
three workouts uh, a week and uh, create a physique like this. So what I want to say is, you know, keep the open mind. Uh, again, I don't want to insult anyone by saying that doesn't work or, you know, this uh, is uh, ignorant. <laughs> uh, I would, uh, you know, try myself. First, I would see if it's logical, if it makes sense. I would attempt it. If it gives you results, you know, then, of course, it's uh, uh, worth doing it. So if you can take one thing from uh, my presentation today and apply to your uh, training program and make it successful, I think it would be worthwhile. But uh, <clears throat> to go with the specifics, uh, pre-contest training really, uh, again, uh, uh, to emphasize, must say heavy. Second thing is, uh, uh, should we really do compound movements only, or we can maybe do machines to still stimulate the fast switch muscle fibers. Uh, I did ex actually experiment myself in 1999 for Mr. Olympia, and I exclusively trained on machines purposely, because uh, uh, you know, some of the experts would say that no, three weights are better, you know, three weights are way to go. And uh, I had actually a different opinion, and the only way that to prove it, I actually experimented myself. So if you analyze any of the movements, um, let's pick uh, bench press. As I was saying, it's something that everybody does. If you do free weight bench press with a barbell, and let's say we fail on a sixth repetition, or we try to attempt uh, a machine uh, bench press, and we fail on a sixth repetition, where do you think we would uh, uh, stimulate more our pectoralis muscle fibers? In the free weights? or in machines. Most of the guys would always go, yeah, free weights, free weights, because that's the way to go. It's tough, manly, you know, thing to do. But uh, as you know, uh, using a free weights, you're using a lot of stabilizing and neutralizing muscles. All the secondary muscle groups are involved as well. And depending on your technique, sometimes some secondary muscle group is going to fail before your pectoralis actually would. On the other hand, machines are created exactly to isolate that one particular muscle group. So chest press would be uh, exactly designed to uh, stimulate just pectoralis. So if you fail six, on a six repetition on a, on a machine, uh, you would definitely fail on your pectoralis muscle fibers. On the other hand, when you do it on a bench press, you might actually fail on a triceps, deltoids, or, or you know something like that. Again, this is one of the things that I always like to uh, emphasize, bench press, as I'm mentioning. Just uh, bench press alone, I can show you hundreds of different uh, techniques that people use to do the bench press. And uh, sometimes they, they have very little chest involvement. You know, if we would keep the elbows in, which most of the guys do, you know, as they're bench pressing, they're using you know, way more triceps. So if you want to exclude the triceps, you would have to keep the elbows out. Now, if uh, uh, we would, uh, you know, use the different grips, for example, close grip, of course, we would involve much more triceps and the uh, inner portion of the chest. As we're going wider, we will, we're going to start stimulating outer chest, right? And there will be less uh, triceps involvement. Many people actually laying on a bench, you know, they don't arch their back, they just keep it flat. And uh, if they attempt it that way, they would stimulate much more front deltoids. And on the other hand, if they extend the chest, they can really focus and feel pushing it from the chest. You know, so many other things, variables, that if a uh, uh, barbell is lower to the neck, even on a flat bench, more of the upper portion of the chest is working, going towards the stomach, uh, a lower uh, portion of the pectoralis. So the point is, any exercise that you choose, you have to really realize what you're doing it for. If your goal is, upper inner chest, you have to pick the exercise exactly for that particular part. So that brings me to the uh, uh, prioritization, like priority training. Uh, as I always believe that bodybuilding should be symmetrical, proportionate physique above all, not just blindly uh, added muscle mass, I would always suggest first to analyze your physique, see what you need to improve. And if uh, you take muscle by muscle, if it's, for example, chest, you should uh, look if it's upper, middle, lower, inner or outer chest that you need to uh, you know, put more muscle mass on. If it's, let's say, upper, middle chest that you need, I would uh, make sure that my first or second exercise that I'm doing heavy weight, 
simulating fast switch master fibers that give me a size, I would specifically you know, try to do something that would reach upper inner portion of that chest. So that would be my choice of a fast switch move. Upper middle chest, for example, it would be incline, you know, close grip, uh, barbell, dumbbell press, or, or even a, a, a dumbbell fly. Uh, so if it's a lacking muscle group that needs more attention, I would put it first into that fast switch muscle fiber um, uh, specific training. Uh, so <clears throat> many complaints I, I had throughout the years that uh, people, when they start dieting, they're telling me they lose the size or when they're training for a contest, you know, of course, they just, the only thing they think about is losing your body fat, and uh, they don't even consider that actually, in the pre-contest period, you can build size. And uh, I'm uh, uh, strongly advocating that yes, it, it is possible to build size at the same time that you're burning body fat. Why not? There are two independent processes. It's again that uh, myth throughout the years that off-season we put size, and then pre-contest, we lose fat. As many of you know, losing body fat has nothing to do with you know, uh, maintaining, increasing, or losing muscle size. If you do it correctly, you can do both at the same time. As a matter of fact, uh, Lee Haney just mentioned um, uh, Franco Colombo. He's one of the guys that, in years, he was actually uh, increasing the body weight you know, close to the contest. Kevin Levroni uh, is doing the same thing. I don't know if you guys follow uh, you know, Kevin's career, but uh, when he would start preparing for a contest, he would be much lighter, and then he would uh, you know, increase his body weight up to the contest. I agree you know, with this, and I think with the proper nutritional manipulation and proper training, you can accomplish just that. So <clears throat> again, pre-contest uh, uh, training philosophy for me is Train as heavy as possible. Maintain your same training like you did in the off season. Prioritize muscle groups because 12 or 16 week pre-contest period is a, a long process. And yes, you can even improve your lacking body part and you can increase the muscle mass. So don't take this uh, idea, it's pre-contest, there's no time to make improvements, let me just get lean. You can do that at the same time. Does anybody have a question uh, as far as that goes? Uh, where we are so far. Okay. Decline benches? Decline? Yes, decline uh, bench is a very good movement for a lower portion of the chest. I particularly don't like that that much myself. Again, uh, I'm a little different than Lee. Uh, he would mention so many different exercises. Don't do it. It's ignorant. And he goes just for body mechanics. And I stand doing something that your body is naturally doing. Makes sense. However, we are athletes, and many times we do something out of the ordinary. Now, if uh, we really know kinesiology and, uh, and uh, right bio biomechanics, and we do it in controlled manner, we can stimulate the muscle doing just about anything, even those walking lunges that he mentioned uh, that uh, he would never suggest. Yeah, I said uh, warming up is, uh, for me, three or four sets. I mean, really, that's, warm up is just that, to warm you up, prepare you for the working sets. Now, you see, uh, Mike Menzer trained um, David Dirt and Aaron Baker, for example, good uh, two of uh, my close friends. And he would go with this heavy-duty principle. And all you can hear is one working set. But he doesn't tell you about four warm-up sets before that, which is pretty much conventional thing that everybody does. You do, you know, certain weight for 10 repetitions, then eight or six or whatever. I've seen, because uh, I'm gym owner in California, and I, I do this for 20 years now, I've seen many guys doing the, pretty much the same thing. They warm up, and I found that many people warm up way too much. It's not really necessary. I do believe that you should warm up, you know, maybe uh, three or four sets. I would, again, uh, choose low uh, rep uh, range, five or six but very slow, you know, controlled. So you, have a, uh, you bring the blood into the muscle, you stretch it, you feel the weight, and then you prepare yourself mentally for that one all-out set. The complaint that I have about uh, um, Dorian, and I did train with Dorian many times, 
in England, in uh, L.A., in, in my gym, everywhere. And he really does do what he preaches. He does that one set all out, which for me was you know, just like a nightmare. I was just waiting, okay, I'm going to kill myself right now. <laughs> Even what uh, Lee was showing us bend over rows, like his, uh, Lee would say, you pick up the weight, feel the weight. No. Yeah, I was training with Dorian, and as soon as uh, uh, we finished some kind of pulling movement, uh, either uh, pull down uh, to the front or to the back, uh, he would choose a bend over rows. And first thing that he puts is four plates, you know, <laughs> four or five, and that's the first set. Like, who, <laughs> you know, I have a bad day, uh, always has some excuse because I didn't want to even attempt that. He does that one set all out, and that was it. Yes. On another hand, also, I want to mention this because it's quite funny. Uh, in 2000, uh, Ronnie Coleman was in my gym two weeks away from the Olympia. And I, I didn't train for quite some time. Uh, I had some incident in the 2000 that uh, actually uh, I wasn't able to do the Olympia. And I, I was completely off training for like weeks. Uh, Ronnie came into the gym and go, Bud, you want to train? I said, sure. What are you, what are you doing? Back. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you uh, Ronnie's pre-contest training. We went straight into, first exercise was a T-bar row with a, in a barbell into the wall, right? Thank God that in a gym I have only those thick plates, you know, those uh, you know, uh, Ivanko thick plates, not those uh, you know, very thin ones, because then we couldn't you know, load all the plates that he intended to do. So as soon as we got there, he put six plates on the first set. This is my max. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, so, you know, what are you doing? I said, you know, it's your turn. I said, like, hey, uh, I'm going to go with the two plates first. Oh, uh, come on, come on. So of course, as my wife was taping the, <laughs> the whole, uh, you know, routine, you know, I had to do what he does. So his first set was six plates. You know, second set was nine plates, and the third, plate, uh, third set was supposed to be uh, 12 plates. Again, thank God for Ivanko that didn't supply me with those thin ones. We stopped on nine. Next exercise, again, for you that trained, you would know that bend over rows. No warm up. <laughs> Five plates in a 495 on the bend over rows. And I, I kid you not, I have it on tape. He was doing it with uh, such a ease. Eep, like this, contracting, no problem. So of course at that point I had a phone call or whatever, it was just to <laughs> you know, get me out of here while well, I'm still alive. Then uh, <clears throat> third exercise, he wanted to do the dumbbell rows and he was crushed that I ha only have a 200 pound dumbbell. <laughs> Seriously. Apparently going with 300, I don't know, in Texas I guess in Hawaii they had a 300 pound dumbbells. So 200 pound dumbbells, he would do like a uh, kid would play with a you know, toy. <laughs> Next exercise was, uh, excuse me, um, deadlift. 800 pounds, yeah, for two reps, again, two weeks out of the contest, super lean, all that stuff. But this is Ronnie Coleman, so how can you argue with a physique like that, you know, of course. And as I was saying, always, always, uh, uh, you know, keep open mind. Lee Haney was champ that nobody could touch him for years. And you uh, see him uh, presenting just now. You know, he went with the common sense and logic. Follow your, your uh, mechanics, body mechanics. Never got injured. And, and uh, he was undefeated eight times Mr. Olympia, which is record. Dorian Yates, who was here last year, again, trained completely different. Accomplished six Mr. Olympia titles, you know, completely different, pioneering that new crazy method that I think, and uh, it still worked for him. On another hand, Lee just mentioned about the 60 seconds squats that somebody was doing in the body pump. I was in France last year and I was training in uh, Paris uh, in a Royal Gym, I don't remember exactly the name, and uh, Serge Nobre was there. So. I was talking to Serge for a while, and I, in the corner of my eye, I, I, I seen some girl that was just doing endless amount of squats. And I'm talking to him for about half an hour. She did not stop, I swear. 
Just to realize he was talking to her something on French. Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? No, he was uh, saying, that, did, she di uh, did she finish 1,000? He made her do 1,000 repetitions, okay? Super setting with something else. So there was 1,000 repetitions, no weight, just 1,000 squats, okay? And then was super setting with whatever else. I don't even want to know what it is. And he was doing six circles like this. So that lady supposed to do 6,000 squats with her body weight, you know, with nothing on it. And that's uh, Serge Nobre. Again, he was way before my time, and I don't know if Lee knows anything more about Serge, but apparently he was training for six hours a day. I know Thierry Pastel, who is one of his uh, uh, guys that he trained, he was doing exactly the same thing. He, you can't get him out of the gym. He was just doing multiple sets. But again, Serge had a great physique. Can I say something? You know, don't do what he does. I can't, because it worked for him. You know, but just to, again, you know, make the point, a lot of people do, you know, tend to have some idea. Uh, <laughs> I like uh, what he says about developing chest by bouncing off from your knees when you're doing a squat. That's something that I must try. But uh, there is really, uh, I do believe as a gym owner, actually, I think that that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to uh, have some uh, hidden camera and tape some of the people, because I think it's, uh, you know, it will be great for the funniest uh, people of, you know, uh, this kind of shows. I had a particular guy <coughs> that I, I just would have to explain you. He was doing this. One uh, uh, handle, right? He would grab the handle with the, the, this arm, you know, pull it all the way. He grabbed the, the other side of the uh, cross bench, turn it around like this, and was, would be pulling it like this. And I swear. And he was doing this every time he would train in a gym, and she's seen it as well. So, of course, I couldn't help but you know, ask him, you know, excuse me, please, uh, uh, what are you working? Uh, he says, this is the best thing for biceps, right? <laughs> and, you know, what can you say? It's just like, you know, concentration, dislocating shoulder exercise, you know, but, uh, you know, what can you do? So, again, to go back to, the, to the, my presentation, for a pre-contest training, just to summarize, again, you know, what made you big would keep you big. Keep it heavy. If you try to change it, it's not going to work. Uh, my uh, view, again, is two exercises, very heavy, fast switch muscle fiber stimulation, two, you know, more controlling movement, any technique you want, triple drop, giant sets, uh, peak contraction, you know, even some, uh, 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 let's say, uh, isometric uh, exercises. Uh, I trained with Dorian, actually, he, that was one interesting thing that he would do. Let's say at the end of the set for um, pretrical, he would try to you know, keep the contraction for as long as he can, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and so on. This is something that our body is not really uh, used to normally, so that would bring another different kind of stimulation. That static contraction is much different than uh, dynamic, either eccentric or concentric. So uh, keep open mind there. Uh, can we, uh, this is a question that I had several times, can we improve muscle separation with any of the exercises? I have <clears throat> several guys that had a problem with the leg separation and they would just say, well, whatever I do, it, it would not work. I do believe, for example, for abs and for legs, I would do always something that overstretches the muscle. If you would do, uh, for example, uh, abs and do the crunches, uh, normal stuff that uh, sit ups, we always limit it with the floor or a bench, and uh, we would extend just like, you know, this much. We would go because we are limited with the floor or a bench. We cannot overstretch uh, abdominals. On the other hand, if I would uh, do, let's say, uh, uh, cable crunches, I would be able to overstretch my ch my uh, abs. And therefore, I, I believe, create more gap in between that abdominal wall, which I did for many years, and I was very uh, happy with the results. And, uh, excuse me, uh, many uh, bodybuilders that I trained that did that exercise uh, dramatically improved depth and separation you know, between abs. Another exercise they like to do is uh, hanging leg raises. And the same thing, the reason, because gravity would pull our legs, 
And if we're doing a, hang, a hanging leg raises, we can create that stretch and make it deeper. Again, there's really no uh, any science that I can uh, uh, refer to and say this is how it is. But this is just like practical, uh, what I've been doing. And I had people uh, do it, and it worked for them. So if anybody uh, has a, uh, excuse me? What help for leg separation? What excess would you do? Yeah, leg separation is tough. Now, uh, usually, again, doing a squat or anything like this, really, you cannot uh, you know, go focus on the muscle 100% super slow, because as you know, if you have a very heavy weight, it would be dangerous for lower back as well. I found that the best separation I do get doing a leg extension, and I, I would do it specifically. And uh, unfortunately, I just want to mention, I'm going to have a good excuse. I had a double uh, surgery on August 1st. I had a quadriceps stair back in January, and I had a August 1st, uh, you know, I had to redo the surgery on my right leg. So, and uh, on the left, I had, a, uh, uh, I had it scoped. So I can't do much with the right leg, but uh, I'm going to demonstrate to the best of my abilities here, one thing that uh, I think brought great separation on, uh, you know, for me and for several guys that I trained. Conventional <coughs> leg extension, we would just contract. I hope it's not too heavy. Okay. Normal leg extension, uh, and I'm gonna do just uh, unilateral with, with one leg. It's just going straight up and down, right? And we can contract the muscle at the top. I found that if I <coughs> try to first use my hip flexors and uh, tendencies to lift your leg up, just like this, right? So I would do that first movement, externally rotate my leg and try to you know, complete the contraction, which actually I did on my video and several other videos and purposely I always use that example so people can see it on the video dramatically you know, brings the separation in between all the quadriceps muscles. So I would use hip flexion first, and then I would try to lift it up and contract at the top. Slow, and a contraction at the top. <clears throat> Again, idea for me is always to do extra stretch, extra stretch. Now again, not to confuse this with the unnatural stretch like uh, <coughs> Lee said about Kevin Lavroni, tearing the uh, pectoralis on uh, actually, there was inclined flies, I believe, 65 pounds. He said, you know, uh, stretch to the point that you can control it. Don't overstretch, uh, you know, that uh, you're out of control. But I found, exa for example, for uh, abs and thighs, I, I could dramatically improve uh, separation if I do exercises like, like that. I'm just gonna say, did you keep your abs high or low, or did you keep the weight? Yeah. Uh, uh, heavier because again if you if, if you keep it uh, I mean high repetitions if you do it heavy it's a fast switch muscle it's a it's a builder it's a, this is not aggressive that we want to build the size this is that we want to use to bring the separation so it's, it's more shaping movement it's more you know f f uh, slow twitch muscle fiber and uh, I would do that slow controlled down uh, squeeze at the top peak contraction and I would try to really uh, you know, usually working your shorts or something, you can actually see your leg. And uh, I promise you, if you do it, if you do it, uh, you know, often enough, you're going to start to see improvement in a, in a separation. Many girls have a, that problem that they cannot have, a, you know, separated legs. Another <coughs> thing that I like to do is those super slow repetitions. Again, you know, this is now uh, not muscle building like... Uh, Lee was talking about, you know, for athletes that want to just get a huge, you know, size and, you know, do the power movement. This is now very, very specific, super slow repetitions that you continuously keep the tension in the muscle. On the centric part and on the concentric. Now, Arthur Jones and many other, uh, Mike Manzer, Dorian, would always uh, make a point of focusing on the centric part. And they say concentric is always explosive. If you try to do that uh, concentric part very slow, you're going to actually have a, a surprise coming to you because it's, it's actually uh, much, much harder you know, than doing it explosively. So if you try on the leg presses, for example, or hex squats, to do five or maybe 10 se seconds down and 10 seconds up, this is one of the most brutal workouts you can actually uh, try to do 
time that mass is uh, under the tension is you know dramatically higher, and uh, you're going to get to the point that you're going to really have a trouble performing 10 repetitions. So <laughs> that's another uh, principle that I like to do. One thing actually that I forgot to mention, I've seen many people in a gym focusing only on that positive part. If it's biceps, for example, they would uh, control on the way up, and then they would literally drop it down. You know, there is actually no such a thing as relaxation during a workout. You can never relax. And now I'm going to control it with the muscle, and now I'm going to just let it go. This is, again, injury waiting to happen. As this is a symposium about injuries, the prevention of injuries, I think it's a good thing that I mentioned about my quadriceps there. That's uh, back in January that I had. And again, I would always be big mouth and say to everyone, oh, I, I can never tear my quadriceps. I was never afraid of quadriceps there. I was always terrified of possibly tearing my chest or biceps, triceps, but for, for legs, I, I could never even imagine it. So after a long layoff, <clears throat> I was preparing for a contest. I just started uh, in my training uh, protocols. And uh, after like third workout, I was doing extremely heavy. And again, this is one thing that athletes can refer to. If you've been there before, if you train super heavy and intense, and now you're trying to make that comeback and be as good or better than you were, you can't really you know, keep yourself uh, short and keep yourself you know, away from what you did previously. So we have that uh, you know, mental drive that, OK, I did it before, I can do it again. So pretty much. Uh, the way I train is uh, if I would go for these three sets of my working sets, there would be six repetitions, right? If I do six repetitions with, you know, with very uh, easily, I would add weight. And if it's that weight also very easy for me to do six, I would add even higher, you know, trying to find that working way that I can do three sets of six. This is what I was doing on the hack squats. and. Uh, I did the six plates on each side. It was very easy. Then I decided, OK, I'm going to do eight plates. And that was easy. So I did 10 plates on each side. And this is when I tore my quadricep. One thing that maybe is going to mean something to someone, doctors, I always, <coughs> in between sets, I had a tremendous, tremendous uh, tightness around, which I thought was medialis, lower portion of you know, quadriceps medialis part. And I was like massaging. It's like, ah. And I was thinking that maybe it's just that intensity that was uh, you know, performing that exercise, but it was actually patella tendon. So on that uh, third repetition, with that weight, when it happened, it just snapped. And I had a rectus femoris and vastus intermedius completely rolled up. And uh, during a surgery, actually, when they opened uh, my knee, uh, doc uh, said that uh, my patella tendon was shredded completely. So there was not actually tendon that he can reattach the muscle to it. And, uh, <clears throat> that you were describing that, you were describing better than I'm sorry? Well, you were talking about that kind of pain, yeah. dull pain or whatever it was, tightness. Yeah. Ex what would you do now to change it, <laughs> to stretch that more? Or? Well, yeah, of course, for, you always have to be prepared you know, for, for a, any kind of physical strenuous activity. Weight training is extreme, of course. Training extremely heavy, pushing your body to the limit on something so heavy, six to eight repetition, of course, is tremendous, uh, you know, uh, risk. So, of course, I would always properly warm up and, and stretch. And I thought I did, but you see, this was like a little bit uh, unrealistic for me. This is a, a, a tremendous amount of weight, more than I could handle. And body was giving me a signs. I just you know, didn't, didn't listen. You know? Yes? Being somebody that I know you've uh, benefited from ART types of therapies, uh, one of the lessons to be learned is for the bodybuilder, no, no matter how much they think they're doing something they've done before, if they are listening to their, to their body the way you were starting to, yeah. and had gone and got some kind of therapy to normalize that tone, would have made it. Yes, you know. You know, I wish I could re reverse the time, you know, trust me, over and over. But at least if, if uh, you know, it's uh, one thing is a good pain and one is a thing is a bad pain. So uh, it's really uh, sometimes uh, you have to be a master to really uh, recognize which one you're having. Uh, I, I did many times workouts that I was, uh, you know, tight. 
but uh, that muscle tightness was uh, different. This was the first time that actually you know, I felt, okay, this is something wrong, but again, that little devil beside you is telling you, yeah, you did it before, come on, CC, you can do it. And this is what happened. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is as far as uh, um, uh, my recommendations now, of course, for uh, uh, training. I do want to say that uh, many bodybuilders that I know, pre-contest, uh, uh, don't even do any cardio. They actually burn body fat with weight training. And uh, <laughs> now Lee probably knows uh, John Brown, you know John Brown? You could never see that guy do any cardio, and you can never see that guy ever diet or take anything away from his diet, including salt or anything else. He would just, oh, I'm an athlete, I'm going to train, and I'm going to eat whatever it takes me to do, and then you know, I'm just going to step on the stage. Terry Pastel was the same way. I've seen Terry Pastel, we were on European Grand Prix tours. This is usually a tour when we travel for five, six weeks together, so you can see what everybody is doing. He would eat just like he is on vacation. Salt, cakes, ooh, you know. <laughs> Vince Taylor, I mean, uh, you know Vince more than me, and, and he was doing this right in front of us. Every day, wake up with the pastries, you know. <laughs> you know, for lunch, you know, for sure, for lunch, you have to have a steak, french fries, and ketchup, tons of ketchup. And every dinner, it had to be finished with uh, ice cream, right in front of us. And that was 91 when the uh, last show uh, that uh, Lee Haney did, unfortunately, the last show, and I do have to say I had the pleasure to compete with Lee at least once. My first Olympia was his last. And I did uh, want to mention this, and I always do, just to, uh, for you guys to understand what kind of uh, guy Lee is. I was, uh, uh, you know, my first time Olympia debut, I was nervous and all that stuff. And I'm coming to that athletes meeting, they told us there was whatever room in a hotel. So I was going there, I was just trying not to be noticed, right? And here comes Lee Haney, stands up from the seat that he was uh, sitting, comes there, you know, asked me how I pronounced my name correctly, and wished me good luck for the Olympia. And I was, I didn't speak much English then anyway, but I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I went to the side, and I see him do this with every single guy that came in. So the true uh, class act that he is, and the greatest representative for the sport, I think I, I, I do know that a lot of people miss you in the sport. I wish you're still there. I'm not going to tell you to come back because <laughs> you know that. But uh, this is really Lee Haney for you. Just like he said, he was looking up to Bill Pearl. He was one of my uh, favorites. I did attend San Diego seminar that you had. I'm sure you forgot about that, but Flex Wheeler and I attended it. And uh, of course, you know, learning from him was you know something that really upgraded both of us and. Flex became professional, and I became professional right after he uh, attended San Diego, gave us some tips. So really, if you use uh, valuable tips, I would say that uh, there is really no limits. I constantly have a people asking me, do you think I can do it? What do you think? Do you think that if you question yourself, you're not, not going to do it. Uh, I don't understand why would everybody, anybody question if they can achieve something. If that's your goal, you can achieve it. You just analyze what you need to do, work hard, be persistent, and you're going to achieve whatever that is. In Yugoslavia, when I started bodybuilding, I made a decision. I want to compete at, uh, in Mr. Olympia. I want to win Mr. Universe and compete at Mr. Olympia. And everybody from my friends and my family were just laughing at me. I said, yeah, might as well go to the Mars. And I said, like, well, I'm going to compete at Mr. Olympia. And you know, pretty much they were all skeptical and they were just uh, basically bringing me down. But I was 100% sure that I can do that and even you know, made a plan within five years that I come to the United States, I'm going to step on Olympia stage. So 87 was uh, when I came to the States and 91 was when I competed at Olympia. You know, so I did accomplish the goal. What I do want to say is <clears throat> whatever goal you, you uh, set to yourself, you can achieve it. Now, if you're talking here about pre-contest for bodybuilding and you want to be the best that you can be, myself doing uh, over 100 shows in my life, I did many mistakes, so I know what, what it means, you know, not peaking correctly for the show. 
do not get discouraged. But do not do the same thing that if something didn't get you in the first show in, in shape, you know, for sure it's not going to get you in the second show in, in, a, in a shape. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. If one thing didn't work for you, okay, analyze, you know, where was mistake. As far as training, what I'm uh, advising you right now, do not change your training from uh, off-season to pre-contest. Keep it he heavy. Don't back off and use lightweight and high repetitions because that doesn't work. Yes, you can include more. You know, you can add more uh, uh, workouts. You know, for uh, uh, off season, but don't change it. Don't don't make that uh, heavy off season light pre contest. Also, I think the biggest thing in pre contest period is changing diet, nutrition. You know, what you're intaking. You know, this is uh, where I think if uh, maybe I can uh, switch to, to, to that a little bit and then I'm going to be open for questions. Uh, training without proper nutrition and uh, supplementation would just not work. You can train better than Lee Haney and Ronnie Coleman and Dorian together. If you ha have no proper nut nutritional support, you're going to have no results or very little results. As you know, whatever we break it down into the in a uh, uh, gym, we have to replenish it at home. Now, <clears throat> uh, what kind of diet I would suggest? Again, I wouldn't make drastic changes. Now, unfortunately, we do have examples that many of the top professionals get terribly out of shape off season. So we see some of the top professionals going from 200 pounds to 280. I'm sure you've seen that uh, muscle tech ad with the Lee Priest, <laughs> who is, by the way, the greatest guy, and he does love to eat. But you know, again, this is really, uh, you've seen the pictures, I'm not going to even comment on. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's first very unhealthy, and it's like nightmare getting in shape. So if you maintain a, a low, low percentage of body fat in off season, and let yourself to the, let's say, maximum 10%, it is fairly easy to get in shape you know, during contest time. So usually my contest preparation would be about 16 weeks. And at 16 weeks, I would uh, you know, try to peak on that given day. Uh, I would, of course, maintain extremely high protein intake. And thank God that we're in a, some kind of symposium like this, because if I say high protein, and the only medical doctors and only people that are you know, following RDA, you know, then they would probably put me in jail. But I always insist on that. that one gram of protein per pound of uh, body weight is uh, uh, adequate, you know, not less than that. And then uh, we can increase from different body types, ectomorphic, mesomorphic, endomorphic, analyze and, uh, yourself and maybe add a little bit more protein to it. So if it's 200 pound guy, I uh, do believe that minimum that he should be taking is 200 grams of protein. And this is uh, uh, you know, where I stand. I've seen it uh, you know, other extremes much more than that. And I'm flexible also. I know that Lee didn't do too, he too much of the protein. You were, to my uh, knowledge, about 250 grams of protein. Yeah? Pound, like you said, pound. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, I know many guys that do you know, much more, like one and a half. And uh, again, <clears throat> as protein is the only building material for our body, uh, uh, of course, not just muscles, everything in our body, skin, hair, uh, bones, DNA, enzymes, hormones, everything is made out of amino acids. I did find that uh, you know, maintaining a high protein throughout the competition would prevent any muscle loss. Because if physiologically your body is in a, in a state that says, okay, my liver needs repair, and my heart needs repair, and my skin, hair, whatever, and muscle, muscle is the last tissue that's going to get it. And uh, so if you have a, a high amount of protein and you have a continuous uh, amino acids in a, in a system, our body would be able to take it and put it you know, in the right place. If you don't have it, something has to be compromised. And usually it's compromised from the muscle tissue. Also, <clears throat> the trick that we do, bodybuilders, and that's one thing that I like to always mention for a ladies, when actually we have ex-boyfriend of Monica Brown here behind. <laughs> Sorry to mention, Scott, but he's here. Uh, Monica approached me in uh, 98 to uh, help her with the diet for Miss Olympia, Miss Fitness Olympia, which she, she won. And uh, you know better than me, but I'm going to mention just that we didn't talk. Monica was, for example, doing 
four hours of some kind of physical activities a day. Uh, out of training with the weights, cardio, rollerblading, and gymnastics. So four hours of activity, and her caloric intake was 1,300 calories. 1,300 calories, four hours of activity, very low energy intake, very high uh, energy expenditure. So of course, uh, I've seen that this was a mistake because her body with all this compromise shut down her metabolism just trying to survive with this kind of energy demand. So I increased her protein intake right away to uh, a very high one and a half gram per pound and then I increased her calories completely and that of course women wouldn't be who they are if they wouldn't panic, oh, you know, no way. <laughs> You know, oh my God. But needless to say, she tried and you know, she, she got in the best shape ever and she won that, that show. The thing is, you know, for, for bodybuilders, if you do not have an adequate protein intake and you have all this you know, amino acid breakdown, muscle tissue, muscle tissue damage throughout the uh, course of training, and you don't have what to replenish, it's just like having a Lamborghini, not having a gas. It's gonna be in a garage, you're not gonna drive it. You need enough protein amino acids to maintain or increase the muscle mass. Our goal is, like I said, to be as muscular as can be. As uh, I told you, I believe you can increase the muscle mass during a pre-contest period, not just maintain it. You can actually increase it. And the only way it's gonna happen is by having sufficient amount of protein. Now, Well, okay, if you go to the specifics, I always believe, of course, first in the solid foods. And if you can have adequate amount of protein from a solid food, that's, that would be the best. And I hope that Lee would agree with this. Food is made for people, e eat your food. But it's almost impossible, it's impossible to get enough uh, protein if I tell you to eat 200 grams of protein if you're gonna be able to eat from just solid foods. Also, it's gonna be very hard for you to get as much protein with such a low fat content that I would suggest, okay, be on high protein, very low fat. Even if you take a chicken breast and you add so many chicken breasts, it's gonna be so much protein, but much more saturated fats that you don't need. So that's where protein powders would be advisable. I do use uh, uh, protein supplements, you know, all the time, I do believe in them, and yes, I would use specifics. Now, fast absorbing proteins like whey protein, I would also always recommend when we need it the most. So immediately after the workout. When you need quick amino acids, that's when I give it. I know that we're gonna have even tomorrow some post-workout uh, uh, nutrition seminar here. My view on this is, as we just train, we stimulated muscle fibers, we did uh, legs, for example, and uh, we had this uh, 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 glycogen loss, amino acid loss from the muscle. So ATP is depleted, uh, glycogen uh, storage is depleted. We have all these uh, micro tears in the muscle fibers. Our body is immediately after workout in a state that physiologically preference of your body is to take care of that shock that occurred. So if you know, within an hour after the training, your body would want to take care of that shock that just happened. So I would like to supply my body what body needs. Amino acids in the bloodstream, and you can do this by either taking a, a free form aminos, uh, with of course high uh, you know, content of uh, essential amino acids and glutamine and so on, or you can try with the uh, whey protein that, is, that could be absorbed within 20 minutes. I also do uh, something that a lot of people were so strictly against it for a long time, I was uh, going with the strictly uh, dextrose, uh, glucose basically, simple uh, carbohydrate, immediately after the workout and uh, for years since 1998 when I was talking about this, everybody was telling me, you're stupid, How, why would you put a simple sugar? But well, glycogen being uh, glucose in water, being depleted and the body want to replenish it is looking for a glucose. If you put any other source of carbohydrates that needs to be broken down into the glucose, you're losing valuable time. So with my analogy and logic is, you're looking for glucose, give your body exactly what it needs, glucose. I know there was uh, experiments with maltodextrin and some other high glycemic, uh, either complex carbs or other simple carbs. I found that the dextrose worked the best. You know, for me, so I would do the dextrose with the whey protein, high amounts of creatine, glutamine, and all that stuff, whatever we want to uh, you know, store. 
<coughs> we were talking about this uh, insulin as a good or bad hormone. Usually we, we uh, don't want to play with, really with insulin throughout the day, but uh, uh, anabolic action of insulin could not and should not be ignored because uh, as a storage hormone, insulin is going to be able to take anything in the bloodstream that can find, and if you create good things like amino acids, glucose, creatine, glutamine, insulin is going to be the one that takes it and puts right back into the exact muscle fibers, muscle cells of the muscle that you just trained. And I did this with the several of the top professionals. The only difference that I made for them was instead of whatever they were doing normally, I would suggest them to train two times a day so they have a two windows of opportunity to store all those nutrients right back in. Danny James, for example, before would always train just once, uh, once a day. For years, all his life, I suggest him train twice. And it, as soon as you finish training, you do that drink. He put uh, about 30 pounds in 30 days. And I have uh, several other of the top pros. I, I did help um, um, Marcus Rule for Night of Champions just recently. And uh, I'm doing uh, several other guys as a matter. The guys that were already at that stage, the reason why I'm mentioning Dennis and uh, Marcus is not because uh, any other reason, but they were already at basically a professional level developed one of those things that we would think, okay, those guys hit the plateau. You know, so if even Marcus Rule, being a monster that he is last year, could get another, uh, you know, 10 pounds in a, in a short period of time, you know, this, uh, you know, I think would tell you something. <clears throat> so, again, I'm not going from a uh, medical and scientific background like some of the presenters here you know because uh, I don't read all the research that is out there but uh, one thing that I do is from uh, 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 physiology uh, that I learned and biochemistry and uh, my common sense I would try to apply something and uh, I actually have a, a opportunity and pleasure to work with many athletes and actually see what works in practice one thing is theory, and the theory is only hypothesis until you actually you know, try it and then you know, see the proof. Now, I, like I said, I have a tremendous amount of people that I help that uh, that particular post-workout thing work unbelievably. Actually, I would encourage everyone to try it, and uh, if your goal is to put a, a quick muscle mass, uh, this thing would just work wonders. So. <clears throat> Close to the contest, I know that Mauro Di Pasquale yesterday mentioned about metabolic diet and, uh, and uh, uh, basically using minimal amount of carbohydrates needed, right, for you to uh, function optimally, and then manipulating uh, proteins and fats. Now, like Lee said, there is many, excuse me, many people going to that, uh, <laughs> I hope Godzilla is not going to come out. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> saying. Many people went on those super low car carbohydrate diets. And like I said, that works for people that are not physically active. Again, to say, like Lee said, Dr. Atkins never trains, so he can say, eat no carbs. You know, take, and anybody, I usually like to do this with, with the people that uh, put bodybuilders down and say, ah, oh, you guys are prima donnas and all that stuff. You, I right away put them on a diet, but I take all the carbs for like three to five days. And you can see how the nicest person can become so miserable and so bitchy and uh, changing the, the whole personality in a short period of time, they can then understand it. You know, so I'm absolutely not against uh, carbohydrates. Uh, you know, but on the other hand, I'm not for too many carbohydrates either. Something like uh, uh, Mauro Di Pasquale is suggesting, minimum amount of carbohydrates to function properly. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, manipulating it high protein and some fats. Uh, Udo was doing a <clears throat> presentation yesterday, essential fats, great thing to do. You know, very, very useful tool for a peak contest dieting when you want to reduce caloric intake. You want to keep a protein high to maintain or increase the muscle mass. And another variable that you have is carbohydrates and, and fat as an energy. You must have higher energy expenditure than energy intake in order to lose body fat. Otherwise, you know, your body is never going to dig deep into the body fat storage. If you have a, 
in a higher intake than, uh, than expenditure. So I would manipulate uh, <coughs> carbohydrate and, uh, and fat intake. Fibrous carbohydrates are uh, one good trick that people were doing for many years. As fiber cannot be digested, it goes through you, fools your body, creates that uh, thermic effect of feeding. Uh, John was talking about this yesterday, I didn't hear everything. But uh, a thermic effect of uh, uh, feeding is a valuable tool because that particular food would increase the uh, uh, you know, temperature of your body and create uh, a, you know, actually uh, ne almost even negative calories. For example, uh, uh, celery, nutrition value. I do believe one stick of celery, there is like uh, less than an ounce, would be five calories. Your body would use more than five calories trying to digest and the final result is not going to even be able to be able to. So this salary is going to go out of your system and your body would actually spend some calories trying to digest it. So for years when I was preparing the bodybuilders for a contest, I would put them on high fibrous carbohydrates, high protein, high fibrous carbohydrates, and playing with their starchy uh, carbohydrates you know, for the rest. So again, going with the common sense, I would uh, do the diet with depending on your activity. You know, for a, a, for a period of the day when you need more energy, I would eat more carbohydrates, and when you have less activity, less carbohydrates. So energy should be taken upon demand. So if I'm going to have an intense workout and I have no carbohydrates, more than likely I'm not going to be able to perform the way I would like to. At the same time, at night time, when I'm going to just go to sleep and have a very low energy requirement, I would reduce or exclude carbohydrates completely. Water. Water. Yeah, for me, uh, close to the contest, I would always use uh, one thing that I learned from Lee. I don't know if he still has that, uh, that uh, uh, feeling. People are saying distilled water. And I was at his seminar when he says distilled this killed water. Is this correct? And he would not use the distilled water. And trust me, from that point on, I never used distilled water because I heard from Lee Haney. He says, why would you uh, take something that, that, that basically has no uh, minerals and electrolytes that uh, is normally there? I would avoid sodium, yes. But uh, I would not use distilled water. On the other hand, again, Mauro Di Pasquale, uh, somebody that I respect a great deal, uh, yes, I just mentioned he uses distilled water you know, for some at least close, close to the contest. As a bodybuilder, okay, I'm just gonna say this one thing. What is our goal when we step on the stage? We wanna be as muscular as possible, so maintain or increase the muscle mass, right? Uh, reduce body fat to the lowest amounts, right? Uh, keep our uh, uh, muscles fully loaded with glycogen or, let me rephrase that, almost completely filled because I believe if you're completely filled with the, with the glycogen, you will lose some separation. So, uh, you know, nicely filled with glycogen, and then you should take all, all the extracellular water out of, the, of your system. So you want to have a lot of water, of course, because if you're completely hydrated, you're going to look flat, and your muscle is just not going to look good. So we want to have as much intracellular water as possible with glycogen stored, is going to give us that round, you know, full muscle, muscle bellies and, and, and a healthy look and a, a powerful look. But we want to take all the extra solid water out. You know, so this is what I think that, that's our goal. This is how I designed my program, okay? On that day, I want to be as big as possible, fully loaded with glycogen, lean as possible, and dry. So to get lean, how do we do it? We have to diet for 16 weeks properly, that every week you would reduce body fat for one and a half, two pounds maybe. So you can slowly, safely reduce all this body fat that on the day of the contest you would have you know, minimal amount of body fat. And that period of time, to maintain muscle mass, that's another goal, we have to do specific strain, just like, like I was saying, eat accordingly, right? so we don't sacrifice any muscle mass. Then close to the contest now, you know, to keep the glycogen in and uh, keep the water out, it's usually done in the last week. So I disagree with people that start cutting the water weeks before 
or uh, even for sodium. I know some guys would cut the sodium month before. Uh, Nasser Asambari is one of them. I remember the first time I talked to him. One month before a contest, he would cut the sodium. That was 93, 94. Uh, you know, so I would actually cut the sodium only three days before a contest. So up to that point. I never asked. Excuse me? I never you never? You never, you never added sodium? No. Or never? Okay. <laughs> sodium, yeah. Should you? No, no, I don't believe in sodium loading either. Uh, again, some people use it and it works great, but timing can be, uh, you know, crucial. And then uh, I've seen many people that try to sodium load and then sodium deplete and, ew, you know, they, they didn't look good. Uh, I would just maintain my normal sodium intake up to the show. Some of the guys that I know would actually add a little bit more to create more, you know, uh, differences because once they stop, his body would, you know, uh, excrete more. Yes? Well, everything depends if you're going to use a diuretics or if you're not going to use diuretics. <laughs> there is a, okay, there is a, if I would uh, prepare somebody and not use diuretics, the two methods that I've seen that work pretty well. Are you going to do carb depletion and carb loading as well or no? Okay, if, if you carb deplete, uh, and just for somebody that doesn't know here, is reducing carbohydrates for you know, a period of maybe three to five days. You know, some people go to the zero carb diet. Lee Haney said for him zero carb was 200. So on the low carb days when we're trying to deplete, 200 was uh, low for Lee. Uh, 200 is something that I would never you know, go under, uh, under that. Dorian, if you talked to him last year, he does the pretty much same about 2 to 50 on those carb depletion days because we still need carbohydrates to take us through these grueling workouts in the carb depletion phase. So we're keeping a low carbohydrate intake training you know, severely so we deplete all the glycogen storage out of the muscle. And idea is usually that in carb depletion days we really take all the glycogen out. In theory, if really your body is depleted completely, then your body would supercompensate. If you deplete just a certain amount and you start eating carbohydrates, you know, it's going to be just uh, uh, putting it back at the normal amount. But if you really go to the, you know, to the end and you deplete completely, then you can supercompensate. And one thing that also I like to mention for competitors that they try, if you try to dehydrate yourself and you are really dehydrated for a few days, then you start drinking, what happens? Not just that you go back to normal, you, you know, rebound, so you, you hold water for a couple of days, you're swollen, you have like edema. Why? Because if body sends the danger and you're dehydrated, once you start sipping, your body wants to supercompensate. So you get supercompensated. Same thing is for glycogen. If you deplete it completely, then you have ability to put more than was previously there. So in, in this instance, I would do Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning, I would deplete my carbohydrates. I would train, you know, uh, heavy and intense. And then immediately after that Wednesday workout, I would set my carb loading. And from that point on, I would uh, watch my sodium. Now, as I was telling you, two methods I found work very well. One is to cut the sodium and load yourself with as much water as possible. Two gallons a day, all the way through, never stopping. Excess water is best diuretic. Now, don't forget, you're cutting your sodium. You have no sodium and you are doing excess amount of water. And if you do this, your body is now you know, in shock. It's overload, overload, overload. You have too much, your body is just releasing it. And then I would do usually that. I would drink as much possible until Friday night, if contest is Saturday, and I would stop completely on a Friday night. Uh, Wednesday, about 72 hours before a competition. But just to give her a second method, you know, because two methods, if you're not going to do diuretics, is one is uh, overload with water, two, even three gallons. The other uh, method is uh, uh, starting Wednesday, if you, if you, what is normal amount of water that you're drinking a day? 
normally that, yeah. Five liters, yeah. If you do this five liters, I would probably do uh, maybe, let's say, six uh, liters Monday, Tuesday. Uh, uh, Tuesday would be five, uh, Wednesday would be four, um, Thursday would be uh, three, and Friday would be, you know, reducing it actually to, to the uh, much less. Let me say, let me rephrase this. I would start cutting it on the last three days, and I would cut it uh, uh, severely. So let's say maybe go just two liters on uh, uh, Wednesday, one liter on Thursday, and half liter on Friday, but without the redis. Yeah. And, and uh, again, in theory, now if you're carving up and you're taking all these extra carbohydrates, and you're having just that little water, this uh, glucose needs that uh, water to be stored as a glycogen. And as you're drinking just limited amount and not anymore, your body's going to have to actually dig into extracellular place to take that water and bring it in to store as a glycogen. So many people do that, and many people are still to this day very successful. Uh, apparently, um, Jay Cutler for last uh, uh, Arnold Classic didn't drink any water for three days. Now, of course. There is always water hidden in, in uh, your carbohydrates. You have to, if you eat rice, if you eat potato, anything else has a, you know, a high water content there, but they would exclude any other water. Now again, this is not something that is healthy. It's extremes, this is extreme sport, but this is a one way how you can do it uh, without diuretics. Maybe uh, use a higher amount of vitamin C, five grams a day, I think for the last uh, two or three days. Is something that also you know work pretty well, uh, you know. So herbal diuretics, if you ever try those, you know. Excuse me. Potassium usually carbohydrates that you load with, are, are, you know, are filled with potassium anyway. So you really don't need much. Excuse me. B6 also yes. Vitamin C and B6. Uh, I have a people taking an injectable form of B6 that I found working a little bit better. But it's not really dramatic, you know, uh, diuresis. Excuse me? Yeah, then there are over RC, there is, you know, several, you know, good ones. Yeah, uh, I tried every diuretic there is. <laughs> so I can tell you, uh, usually uh, the safest uh, and something that I would put my, most of the pros on would be aldactone, which is an aldosterone blocker. So you would do in the last uh, three days. I know that the conventional method years ago was you go slowly for like 10 days before and slowly increase. I found that three days is more than enough, just Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to just control that aldosterone, you know, uh, you know block it, and then uh, drink as much water as possible up until Friday night, just like I was suggesting. And just if, you need something on Friday night, you can do some mild, you know, a diazide diuretic, you know, and that's, uh, if I can talk about those things. <laughs> no, no. Now the thing is, you see, uh, really, if you put the glycogen in, glycogen has uh, water, right? And you can't really break the glycogen with a diuretic. The erratic is going to take water out, but it's not going to be able to break down the glycogen and take water out and release glucose. So I, I don't believe in that. Now, uh, this, uh, this happens to the guys that actually, you know, train in the last few days. They take aldactone and they continue training. And, uh, you know, I've seen that. Or the guys that pose for a couple of hours, you know, in the last couple of days. But if there is no... Yeah, very high, very high. Drink all the way through. Yes, and that's also, you must understand, of course, we all exchange the knowledge. And uh, this is one thing that I accepted from Dorian a long time ago. He would always, you know, do the same, aldactone only three days before and drink all the way through. As a matter of fact, he, even Dorian would say he always wanted to drink water all the way through, even the day of the contest, but we always get a little paranoid and scared. Yeah, Friday night, usually you cut it out. Also, there are methods that uh, a lot of guys like to do is cut out any carbohydrates day before, like 20, 20 hours before the show, and just go like with a pure chicken breast or 
just pure diuretic. I mean, the protein that would work as a diuretic. I tried actually that method. I was not afraid to drink water. You know, day of the show, it didn't work. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't really fat load, but I, I do have a considerable amount of good fats. Now, uh, that real fat loading that some people suggest, instead of carb loading, I don't believe it. But uh, I always go with a you know, good 50 to 80 grams of fat a day, you know, close to the show. I, I go with a, you know, nuts or peanut butter or, you know, steak. Every morning of a show, I always have whole eggs, you know, five uh, eggs over easy, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, steak is normal. That's normal. I do know that a lot, a lot of people pig out. You know that that system of, you know, day before a show, eat anything. First thing that I, I heard in Yugoslavia when I was doing it is, oh yeah, before the show you can do anything. So I would, we would all just wait until that Friday night before, and then you know, go for hooray. You know, whatever is there, you know, we ate it, and you know, trust me, it can it can. Uh, you know, rebound that fast, by, by next morning you can lose the condition. Yes. Any more questions? Well, uh, you know, like I said, we have to play, we're all individually different. So I would always say protein, minimum one gram of protein per pound, this is a must. And some people need more. Now this is a uh, you know, building nutrient. Energy nutrients, carbohydrates and fat depends on your body type, gender, age, activity. So if energy intake you know, it needs to be uh, lower than energy expenditure, then you have to adjust it properly. You know, so this is how I do it. Uh, <laughs> so actually I have uh, many people as high as two grams of protein per pound. Uh, actomorphs, of course, need much more than, than anyone else. But I've uh, seen, again, who is really, I would like to see anybody that is such an expert that's going to tell me, okay, you are anamorph or combination, or you are 30% anamorph, 70%, you know, come on. Who can do that, really? Yeah, we are all combination of, you know, so this is how I go by. But uh, again, Protein, like I said, uh, and I know there are many nutritionists here that I would like to know their opinions. I, I go with many guys as high as two grams of protein per pound. If I would reduce carbohydrates and fats, and I would go with this, okay, I'm going to reduce this, I would increase protein. Because then, worse comes to worse, our body needs energy. We can use gluconeogenesis and convert that protein for that little energy that we need so we can maintain muscle mass and still have energy to work out. I tell you this, okay, if you go on my website, you're going to see the guys that I help. And there's about 20 top IBB pros. Every single one of them takes minimum 1.5 and most of them 2 grams of protein per pound. Every single one of them. Again, I, I've seen the tapes from last year's Swiss here and there was a Professor McDonnell or something saying that there is no, there is proven, there is no need for more protein than 1 gram per pound. I would really like to question that because, again, like this is theory, hypothesis. I have a top uh, professional bodybuilders doing it with the one gram having a no results, doing it with the two grams exploding, having a you know tremendous increase in muscle, lean muscle tissue, and so on. If you miss my presentation from the beginning, there is no difference between off season and pre contest. Pre-contest and off-season, same amount of protein, same training. Off-season, pre-contest, only difference pre-contest is less carbohydrates and fat. Energy uh, intake is, uh, is uh, reduced. That's the only difference, I would say. And this is probably why I did 70 professional shows and I was just doing every show that I organized because it was not hard for me to get in shape because if you're always close, you can just do it. Like 1999, for example, I didn't plan to do any of those shows, but I was in shape, there was a contest, okay, I'll do it. You know, this is really how it is. Because then you just need the last few weeks to peak for the show. Okay, yes, I, I, 
I actually do have a videotapes here available, and I'm giving it for a wholesale to you guys, which actually I do have a, uh, uh, it's an instructional training video with all the specifics. Now, it's not entertaining, Sean Ray kind of video to show you my house, my bathroom, and my fridge. It's a, it's a really, uh, you know, strictly uh, training, you know, with the, all the specifics of how to simulate long head, short head of the, you know, biceps, lateralis medialis, or the quadriceps, upper, middle, lower, back, chest, or whatever else, in, you know, because they really went into the uh, extent to, because I believe in symmetrical physique, I see people that have a problem and they'll say, oh, I have a great medialis, but I can't do nothing for, you know, outer sweep, or I have uh, this, but not that. So this is why I have that video too here. Any more questions because before we finish? No, there's no diet. Yeah, it's training only, yes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Before workout? Okay, her question is what I recommend before the workout. Uh, my, actually, I didn't even talk about the general dieting. My, uh, I would have a six to eight meals, per se, to, during a day. Each meal would be uh, adequate, same amount of protein. If I would decide you need to be on a 200 grams of protein and you have a six meals, that would mean like 30, 35 grams of protein each meal. Carbohydrates, complex starchy carbohydrates, you know, and the times prior to your activity. So before your workout, the choice of carbohydrate would be starchy complex carbohydrate, something that would give you sustained energy, not high blood sugar level, you know, uh, that you would have ups and downs. So about hour and a half before workout, I would have a starchy carbohydrate. Again, adequate for you, because I, I, I still don't know exactly how intense you train, or what you want to accomplish, but a meal that would be enough to take you through the intense workout. For me, it might be 100 grams of carbohydrates. For you, it might be 30, 40, 50. You know, starchy carbohydrates. Now, immediately after, this is when I do the simple carbohydrates to replenish the glycogen. And after that, I just go fibrous carbohydrates to, uh, uh, you know, uh, fool my body to have actually uh, higher energy expenditure, not really calories, you know, from uh, any other source of carbohydrate. Our minimum one hour, hour and a half. Now I know that there is also, this is a, the, if I have a few minutes, yeah. John uh, was one of them that has seen that suggest something to take immediately uh, during a training. Lee just mentioned he would uh, never do anything during a training because uh, during a training nothing should be done except train. Uh, I also agree with the John in the views that we have a 24 hours a day that we want to make improvement. Why would we waste one hour of a day during a training and not be anabolic? It's actual, you know, training is not anabolic, like Lee is gone, so I can say, uh, like he, he says, it's a catabolic activity. And if we can actually create an anabolic environment, we can uh, actually start that uh, building process during actual training. So there are specifics that you can uh, uh, take during a training, which uh, I always do. Three minutes? Okay, sorry. First thing, yeah, a lot of people wake up and go straight to train. Again, for me, there is uh, always a long period of time. If you don't have any nutrients, you're going to become catabolic and you're going to have to compromise. I would always suggest, you know, something. Shake, yeah. Now, there is a... a Yeah, a combination of bench and aminos, you know, some other, you know, free form aminos, probably digested, some kind of uh, uh, glutamine, of course, uh, some kind of simple carbohydrates or maltodextrin, and some electrolytes. Everything depends, you know, how intense you train, what is your body type, and so on. Can you train pre Yeah. I would take a total of about 50 grams of all this amino acid powders. Yeah, combined, yeah. With branch aminos, glutamine, and then other, yeah. And I would start, I would start with a, with a, immediately, and I would try to finish it halfway through. And then immediately after the training, I would take my post-workout, 
in a shake. Uh, everything depends. Uh, you know, 50 minimum, 75, and maybe sometimes 100. Depends what I do. Smaller body part less, bigger body part more. Combined together. Yeah, combined together in this. Yeah, actually, because there is no such a drink available, what I do, I take a Gatorade, <laughs> and then add everything that I need. You take a Gatorade. I take a Gatorade. Yeah, might as well. There is a good electrolytes there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yes. Okay, yeah, I guess we're done. I'm going to be there uh, to send some photos, and, uh, and uh, if you do have more questions, I can answer it there. Actually, I'm here all day long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for our next yeah. seminar and to present them with uh, the Swiss Eagle. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, you, should, you should tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.